Weaponized narrative is a term I hadn't heard prior to the last couple of years. But information has long been an element of national power and a weapon when employed by skilled operators. Today's guest warns the United States and its Western allies face a foe tremendously skilled and motivated in the use of information as a weapon. She's Molly McHugh this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. We do that by visiting each week with the best contemporary storytellers, authors, scholars, filmmakers, and journalists. Really, anyone using or studying narrative to explain the world in which we live. This week, we're joined by an information warfare expert, Molly McHugh. Molly, thank you so much for being with Thanks us. Thanks for having me. So there's so much that we want to talk to you about today. Uh, but let's start with so something sort of maybe a little bit more foundational. You're a Russia hawk. Mm -hmm. Right. Why? Uh, I've worked in the region for a long time. I studied Russian in school. I studied Russian history and literature and language, uh, and then sort of got pulled into the wars with everyone else after 9-11, uh, eventually made it back out to the region um, just after the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008. So during this period where Russia started pivoting from its clunky old conscript army model toward what is now its special forces based model in the military with all the new investments in military hardware and, and weapon systems. But they really reinvested in the idea of political warfare after 2008 because they didn't get what they wanted out of the Georgian War. They got a lot of it, but they didn't really get what they wanted. Um, so there was this shift toward all of these new investments in what is now their modern propaganda machinery, um, the embrace of social media, sort of learning that there were these new things that they didn't really know how to use, seeing them invest more in uh, you know, political forces uh, in the former Soviet states plus in Europe. Um, but all of the new means of Russian influence that in the United States we've been paying more attention to in the last year started evolving in that time period between 2008 and uh, 2012. And, and, and part of this is you're, you're reacting to what you see as Russia's intentions. Yes. You, you've written that uh, Putin's played a long game. What is it? It's this... I mean, the, the long game for Putin starts much longer ago. There's, I think, one of the, everybody's always looking for the best way to psychoanalyze Putin. What is Putin? Who is Putin? Is it the judo analogy, you know, using your opponent's strengths against them? Um, I think for, for me, the story that always explains Putin the best is he was in Dresden when the Soviet Union was collapsing and was in charge of the little KGB station that was there. And down the street, the um, Stasi headquarters was being overrun by a riotous mob who was ripping it apart. Stasi being the East German secret yeah. police. Yeah. So they were, you know, the building was overrun. These guys were being torn apart in the streets. And uh, he called for backup from the local Soviet artillery battalion that was stationed nearby. And the response came, we're waiting on Moscow, and Moscow is silent. And for Putin, this was this transformative moment of like the greatest sin of the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was not that they lost or anything else. It was at the moment of crisis, no orders came. And I think the time period after that, so he goes back to Russia, he transitions into politics, obviously stays very much KGB attached, uh, ends up back in that position as well. But what in the West, we were watching the 90s as the democratization of Russia, the opening up of Russia, and the way the security state of Russia saw it, all of the intelligence services, was the removal of political constraints on them. And during the 90s, they slowly took over uh, more business. Uh, they absorbed the Russian mafia and the criminal enterprises. They slowly took over pieces of the political class until you had the Moscow apartment bombings, the Second Chechen War, and then Putin becomes president. Are there, are there any factors in 
Putin's even earlier background in terms of his childhood, where he was, you know, born and raised, what his parents did, that that also can help perhaps explain in a psychoanalytic fashion. You know, there are details, and and right when he kind of emerged as prime minister, there was a an effort to sort of write a little biography on himself, first person, <laughs> that has been picked apart by just about everyone. But it's hard to know what was actually real in that. And there's a lot of debate about who Putin really was, um, what he was really doing for much of his KGB career. Was he just some mid-level colonel, or was he actually uh, something more important than that? Um, it, it's There are pieces of his story that seem to be things he's attached to in terms of who his uh, grandfather was. Um, or so he says, uh, but someone connected to Stalin, <laughs> and you know who his who his parents were, or so he says. Um, but much of it seems to be that he he really was a Soviet kid who came from nothing and became what he is now, and he got there through the intelligence services. So what does he want today? What does what does he want? I think the the baseline of what the Kremlin is trying to achieve with Putin at its head is they don't like the rules-based international order. They know that Russia can't compete in that system ever. They are not a big enough economy. Yes, they have nuclear weapons, but that's the only thing that's even giving them a seat at the table anymore. And for Russia, this is unacceptable, that they are not considered a great power in every respect. And, and that has deep roots in Russian history. Absolutely. The, it, very, very much an old mentality. Uh, uh, and it's, Russia has always been this sort of great unknowable thing. It's been separate from Europe, but connected when the monarchies were still intermarried. Mm. And, um, but it's always been the sort of weird giant frontier that was semi-impenetrable in terms of our understandings. And, and I think you know, Putin really embraces some of that. The Russian concept of exceptionalism, so what Putin has really formulated as Russian exceptionalism, is not like American exceptionalism, this idea that we are unique and, and great for reasons of our own history. Um, for for Ru the Russian exceptionalist concept is Russia must be distinct and apart as it has been in its whole history in order to be great. And the inherent danger in that, of course, is this idea that Russia has to remain isolated, that the Kremlin has to remain in control of the Russian-speaking world, um, and it has to have these constant conflicts with someone outside. But I think for Putin, the kind of chaos they really embrace. You know, a lot of times the strategies that they are uh, executing, it's just tearing it down. And, and for us, this makes no sense. Why on earth would you execute these crazy intelligence operations or other destabilization campaigns if you don't know what's going to come out the other side? But the logic for them is, we know we're focused over there. We want to get to the other side and build what, build what comes next faster. And since we're focused on that, while everybody else is churning around, we're going to cut through and get to the other side. And they've been very successful in using that strategy. So how? Do they do that? What, what what are the means at their disposal that they're that they're employing to achieve this kind of deconstructive end? Absolutely, there's uh, it, it's anything, and I think this really is when we talk about whatever you want to call it, full spectrum warfare, hybrid warfare. Um, it's the anything on the table model, and and I think sometimes we do underestimate the extent to which Russia is willing to use hard power and military power to achieve its objectives. If you see what they did in Georgia to keep Georgia and Ukraine out of NATO, they invaded and uh, seized 20 percent of Georgian territory. Um, you know, if you see what they've done in Ukraine, similar idea, but to keep them out of the EU. Um, you see what they've done in Syria to sort of completely change the landscape of the Middle East. Same in the Arctic, which none of us are even paying attention to, but the extent to which Russia has deployed military resources to advance their strategic interests there is really troubling. Um, so there is the hard power aspect that I think we haven't been talking about enough because we're also focused on all their soft power aspects. But the entire other lanes of whatever you want to call it, political warfare, information warfare, other means of influence, um, all of these have become overseen by the Russian intelligence services in a variety of capacities. But the funding of political forces in Europe that are inherently anti-European uh, or, or believe more in the, a lot of times it's supporting super ultra-nationalist parties, so people who are very focused inward, uh, Georgia for the Georgians, Austria for the Austrians, you know, these old school uh, nationalist type forces. 
Um, but funding political parties that they view as in some way helping them achieve their various objectives. Uh, sometimes it's things that people don't really see clearly, like Russia has invested a lot of money supporting green groups, especially in Europe, which we would think, why would they do that? But the green groups uh, oppose fracking, and Russia doesn't want anybody to frack because it challenges it's, their energy their dominance. Base, so, right? yeah. it, it, you know, you look at it on its face, and it's like, why is Russia supporting all these environmental causes? That doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense in terms of their energy objectives. So they have these very tactical uh, relationship things that they do that don't seem to make sense, but they are willing to invest in something only to achieve one end. And then, yes, this you know these green groups will run off and do other things they don't really care about. But for the one thing, it was really important. So, so when you say when you talk about um, you know like Austria for the Austrians or Itali Italy for the Italians, and I, I think about the new government in Italy, which is. Um, expressed uh, 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 more sympathy towards Moscow than its yep. predecessor. Um, and there are reports of some ties between uh, yep. that coalition government and Moscow. Um, but there's also an alignment, it seems, with sort of the ideology and the, and the, the articulated views of somebody like Steve Bannon in the United States. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insights on that? Uh, I think the why is this, uh, the connectivity between the groups is the thing that everybody's waiting to find the aha on. But whether it is, again, opportunistic or more, um, there is, in fact, very much a, a worldview that Bannon has embraced. But for Bannon, it was this belief, or at least as he articulated it last year, uh, that Trump should be the head of this global political change, this global political movement. Um, that is more inherently populist, nationalistic, however you want to define it, um, but that he can be, that all the things he used to win the election in the United States, same concepts can apply everywhere else, um, and they would be fundamentally destructive to all of the alliances that we, the United States, have used to become secure and prosperous in the last 70 years, but Bannon doesn't believe that matters. <laughs> and I think he has become, as you have seen, he's spending more time in Europe. He's coordinating with a lot of these political forces. He's coordinating with the people that are helping them. He's attached to the people that are funding all of these causes. Um, you know, his relationship with the Mercers, which seems to be on ice now, but nobody really knows. I mean, the Mercer family funded Brexit. The Mercer family funded Trump. If you look at the way private, political, ideological means backed by incredible wealth can screw everything up, it's a come to Jesus America hasn't had yet in terms of its dark money in politics that uh, we really need to talk about because I don't think any of us want what are basically American oligarchs determining the outcome of our political future, but they are. So what happened in 2016 in America vis-a-vis -vis Russia? It's a good question. And, and uh, a question that could consume many programs. I think that the 20, what we are now looking at in the 2016 peace started much earlier, um, definitely by 2015, but, but more than that as well. And you go back to, there's these great old videos of Soviet defectors, like KGB defectors from the, for, that came out in like the mid 80s, but guys who left toward the beginning of uh, the 80s. And you know, people are asking them, well, isn't it great? You guys had such a good, good relationships with the left in Europe and the left in the United States and all these communist sympathizers. Like, wasn't that a good tool for you? And they, this one guy basically says, the left. Who cares about the left? We will win when we get access to the conservatives, is basically what he says. And that has been what Russia is focusing on for the last, certainly since the rise of Putin. But this idea that Putin and Russia are the champion of traditional values, however you want to define that. And the gateway drug to Putinism in Europe and in the rest of the world has become the Kremlin's extremely sophisticated and very well-funded anti-LGBT efforts. But the Kremlin championing anti-gay things everywhere has given them access to conservatives and traditionals, the traditional values, parties, um, everywhere, including in the United States. The fact that evangelicals in the United States coordinate with the Russian Orthodox Church, which if they read Russian, they would understand the Russian Orthodox Church calls them Satanists and, you know, one step above heathens. I mean, the Orthodox Church does not represent evangelicalism in any way. Um, but evangelicals are now taking money from the Russian Orthodox Church and coordinating them with them because they all hate the idea of gay rights so much. So this has become this really important avenue of approach from the Kremlin outward. But they find these strange traditional 
conservative things that they have invested relationships in. The NRA, so guns, God, uh, militia groups in the United States, anywhere they could build these sort of very tactical compatriot type relationships, they have. So I think that was going on for a longer period of time. And then, again, coming out of that period between 2008 and 2012, in 2012 you saw uh, the Russians really leveraging social media and sort of black PR in the election in Georgia, where a Gazprom oligarch was elected prime minister, um, which no one pays any attention to, but we all should. <laughs> and then the period after that, you saw much more aggressive use by Russia of social media, of sort of political influence, of all these new tools of political warfare they were developing elsewhere. And I think in the US, they were already leveraging some of these things, but it got more and more sophisticated. So by the time you get to 2015, there are entrenched Russian information networks operating as Americans, fake American accounts, fake American news organizations, fake American groups, um, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, sort of infiltrating and then turning narrative within specific groups that they were trying to target. And I think that there was a ton of other things going on too in terms of money and other connections to things in the United States. But this piece, I think, is the most significant, was the information warfare that was being run by the Russians against the American people. So this is, <clears throat> this is well documented. It has been written about you know, repeatedly. It's the subject of investigations, including the special counsel. Why do large numbers of Americans still simply not believe that this happened? The whole purpose of this type of warfare, sort of the left of the boom warfare, is that you're not supposed to see it. Uh, that it, it operates by subversion, um, by changing you, the way that you think without you really understanding that, or getting you to do things without really understanding how that happens. Um, but that is the point of it, and I think this is the challenge we all have. Americans are stubborn, uh, we're a fairly optimistic people, nobody wants to believe that they think something or have done something for because somebody else told them to. We all think where you know, free will is a big part of the American identity. Um, but in fact, there's a lot of documentation that shows how easy it is to influence people using social media. But you, you wrote you know, a really powerful essay on New Year's Day of 2017 that you know, at that point there was still a lot that we didn't know. We know a lot more now about what, what Russia was doing in 2016 than we did even then. Uh, but you basically said, you know, uh, Trump should have accept the fact that he won the presidency and accept the fact that Russia did try to help. Uh, because if he does that, he sort of takes away all of Russia's power, Absolutely. whatever it might be. So we know now, after the Helsinki summit, that President Trump did not take your advice. Um, Go uh, figure. Yeah. So, so, so but the, I think that the question is, um, why do you think he seems so reluctant uh, and so has such a challenging time articulating unequivocally that Russia had a hand in that election of 2016. Because, yeah. as to Wade's point, uh, the special counsel has, has, has articulated it, the bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee has articulated it, there's plenty of journalistic accounts that, that document these things. Why does the president have such a hard time articulating this? This is the $40,000 question. Uh, I think the reason that I wrote that piece, um, which I spent a long time writing, because it was very hard to sort of put it all together, but those of us that work on the region, that work on Russia, that have watched what Russia has been doing to its neighbors and in Europe for the last decade, saw the same patterns of influence and infiltration with members of the Trump campaign, certainly with business interests around Trump, with possibly with Trump himself. But seeing what was happening during the campaign really disturbed us because it is what it is. And if you're used to looking at these patterns, uh, you know, none of this is, uh, oh, it's a special America case study. This is, if you, if you put together what the Kremlin has done other places, we are one data point in a long spectrum of these activities. And if you understand that spectrum, um, it's much easier to say uh, this is a problem. Yeah. Like there was a definite Russian influence in th that, that was meant to determine an outcome in this thing. I think the problem everybody has is picking the pieces apart. You know, what was Russian influence on social media versus, you know, Jared Kushner's special <coughs> data operation or whatever. You know, how do you pry apart the campaign from Republican stuff, from Russia? Can't. It's all sort of overlapped. So I think. That was the problem, is we were all looking at this and saying, this fits into this spectrum, but now what? And the point of, of that essay in, in the beginning of 2017 was really to lay out 
okay, we, the United States, have not been paying attention to Russia as much as we should. We've been focused on counterterrorism and wars in the Middle East and Afghanistan and other things. But this is what the last 10 years have looked like. This is how Russian doctrine has pivoted. This is how their view of the world has changed. This is how their mindset has changed. This is how they think and what they're doing. And this is how it now applies to us, because all of their goals are about limiting the possibilities of American power in the world baseline, everything else. Blow up NATO, blow up the EU. It is about ensuring that American power is weakened in every aspect. Um, and that should matter to us. So yes, they were clearly playing in the election. It was clear that Trump benefited from this regardless. In, in 2017, I think at the beginning, you could still say, we don't really know what happened. But you've got to embrace this. And the quickest way to take away the power the Kremlin was trying to build over Trump was for him to come out and say, Russia attacked our country, we need to do this. And he just didn't. I think if you look at the Helsinki and Singapore summits and other events as well, and the rapport that the president has and continues to have, and, and maybe personal affection is too strong a term, but there's something there that he relates to, both with Putin and Kim Jong-un. From a psychological point of view, how do you assess that? What, what is there about their personalities that appeals to him? Because something appeals to them. It's beyond simply politics, in my view. Absolutely. I think uh, thugs and strongmen tend to like each other more than more moderate, considered rational humans. It's, it's a personality type that you look in the mirror and you see yourself and you think, oh, I already know that guy, that's all right. These guys do operate the same. If you look at Putin and Kim and Erdogan and Orban and the guy in the Philippines, you know, they have the sort of same operational mindset of, well, you know, I'm just going to punch somebody in the face and nobody's going to do anything about it. So, but I think, so some of it, what I think is personality based. Um, but I think Trump does want what Putin has, which he has said openly about him, Putin and Kim, this idea of being the beloved, benevolent, immovable leader. Uh, something about that really appeals to him, and that very much worries me, uh, just in the way he operates from the White House and the way he has been able to undermine institutions in a way I think Americans haven't had time to pay attention to because there's just too much chaos. So you were part of a, uh, a Twitter fight one of several. Um, Always. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that seems to be the thing to do these days. <laughs> that, that coming out of the Helsinki summit, right, yep. you and Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, uh, who is a former commander of U.S. ground forces in Europe, yep. right, uh, you wrote an article where you basically said that uh, what happened in 2016 was an act of war. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of analysts who aren't willing to go that far, yep. right? Because that, that means something really serious that I think everybody Absolutely. understands. Why do you think it was an act of war? I think if our adversary defines what they are doing to us as warfare, and they do say that very openly, um, particularly on the information domain, that this is information warfare that they are winning, um, then we should take that seriously and understand what it is that they are doing and react. And I think this... The, the strangest part of President Trump's non-reaction to any of this in the last few weeks, when he said, you know, when he was asked, is Russia still attacking us? And very clearly said no, even though he has now walked back, right. back everything, of course. But that was in a week when there was new information coming out that Russia is still trying to infiltrate voting and election systems. That. Uh, three or four intelligence chiefs were testifying or giving speeches saying, we need to deal with this, we haven't dealt with this, this is really gonna screw us up. Um, and you have the president dismissing it. And for us, this is, it's not just negligence of duty, he is trying to disarm the American public against a threat, against an attack by a foreign adversary, and it's gotten to the point where we cannot ignore what that means anymore. But it is an act of war. I mean, this is the new warfare, and this is the warfare that we are behind in learning how to fight and defend against. It's, I mean, the, the visual version of it is essentially, you know, we're the Redcoats lining up with our little muskets, and we're surrounded by guerrilla insurgents who are gonna keep shooting at us, but we keep thinking the rules still apply the way they did 20 years ago, and they just don't. But, you know, th this can't really be a surprise to, to even, you know, the ordinary person. You know, the battleships went away 50 years ago. People have been talking about cyber warfare and yep. warfare of this sort for a long time, and yet still, some people are not accepting it. I why? Think the, the I, again, I keep coming back to that, you know, it's the big why that we have on this show a lot. 
I think for us, again, it's just a total difference in mindset. We were talking about this a little bit this morning, actually, Hurtling and I, but like, um, we still, when we're thinking about Russia, the arguments are always these special considerations. Well, it's a nuclear power, so we can't do X. We need to be worried about X because, ah, you don't want to provoke the nuclear bear. Um, and we've still thought this way. Obama was the biggest believer in this nonsensical mindset of everything you do is going to provoke the Russians, so you just can't. Um, this is where we now are. I mean, you can't keep thinking this way. But I think we keep putting them in this special category of great nuclear power that has to be dealt with with special rules. The reason that Russia's full spectrum warfare has become extremely successful, particularly against us, uh, is the leveling out of how they view adversaries. What they use to attack us is the same thing they're using in Montenegro and Estonia and Georgia. And for us, we would laugh at this idea, you know, that you're attacking the United States the same way you would attack a country of one million people with no nuclear weapons <laughs> or any real defensive force. Um, but that is what they've done. And because when you're using these hybrid means, asymmetric means, it's so low level, it's so cheap. 95% of what they do is abject failure, like attempted intelligence operations that just fizzle out. But the ones that work, work really well. So they just keep throwing resources at it. 10 seconds, are we going to win? We will win if we fight. We got to leave it there. Molly McHugh, thank you so much for being with Thanks us. For me. Uh, that's all the time we have uh, this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, inviting you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.